Number 30 is Smoky Valley. 31, Pleasant Ridge. 32, Busseville. 33, Evergreen. 34, Dry Ridge. 35, Adams. 36, Cando. 37, Lidoji. The last two schools are on Little Blaine Creek. Number 38, Springdale on Rich Creek. Number 39, Elm Grove on Blaine Creek above the Wellman Bridge. Situated in the foothills of Appalachia at the confluence of the Big Sandy River, Lawrence County was formed in 1821. It was created with land taken from Greenup and Floyd counties to become Kentucky's 69th county. At approximately 415 square miles in land area, Lawrence is the 29th largest county in Kentucky. The early settlers of this rugged new territory took it upon themselves to provide an education for their children. They built crude log structures, often with dirt floors, known as old field schools. These pioneer schools were funded by families seeking to teach their children basic skills necessary for life on the frontier. Families paid one to three dollars per month in tuition for students to attend school. Since tuition was used to maintain the building, teachers during this time were seldom paid money. Instead, they were paid in commodities like pork, corn, and whiskey. Room and board for the teacher was often provided by families living near the school. Teachers were rarely trained, but tended to be the most learned members of their community. The early curriculum of pioneer schools included the three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic, as well as lessons from the Dilworth Speller and the New Testament. These early schools provided a framework for what would become the public education system in Lawrence County. By the 1900s, one-room schools were prevalent across Lawrence County due to geographical necessity. Because of isolation and lack of transportation, each community had their own one-room school. Frequently, these schools were populated by members of the same family. Many aspects of one-room schools were very similar regardless of the location. Commonalities included the upkeep of the building, lack of supplies, inconsistent attendance due to home responsibilities, and the importance of the community at large. I started teaching in Lawrence County when I, it was 1959. And I started in a one-room school. It was called Meads Branch School. And I had all eight grades. I did not have a college hour. Mr. William A. Cheek was superintendent then, and he asked me if I would get six semester hours during that semester. I said yes, and that was a promise. I had to keep it, so after I got the six hours, I just got that chalk in my blood or whatever, and I couldn't stop, and I just kept going. Uh, my mother, Lucille Graham, taught in a one-room school, went to a one-room school, and uh, when she started, she went to Buchanan, which was, I think it was two rooms. She had to board with people because she couldn't go from Blaine to Buchanan, and people didn't have cars much back then, so they rode horseback. And uh, she worked down there, and then Bill Cheek, who was the superintendent, went, because she still lived at home, she, she was unmarried, and he went to her daddy, Arthur Morris, who was a, another school teacher. And um, he told uh, Arthur, my grandfather, that he was going to give Lucille a school and not to worry about it because if, the, if she got run off, that's what happens. Well, anyhow, so she goes in with a little bad boy that had run off two other teachers, fell madly in love with my mother, loved her, so she didn't have a bit of trouble. Well, a few years passed, her and daddy gets married, and four of us little kids came along. The school at Evergreen, which is located about six miles from Louisa. This was when the old road, old 32, was there. It was, was six miles. 
and I went to school there from the second grade through the eighth grade. And then my, and then I went into the third grade down at the school building because uh, we had to have a teacher then. So uh, the lady came up every morning on the, uh, what we called a doodle bug on the train. At that time it was a big steam engine, but later on it became a diesel operated train. And uh, she came up every morning and most of the time Elliot Clark, I believe it was, would go down, they call him Lightning, Lightning nowadays. We would pick her up and bring her over to the school building. And uh, we had to go on down to the school. Me and my brother, we walked down the street in front of her house and on down the alley to the uh, black school. If you had a chance to look inside this building, you see one central vent hole in the roof of the, bu of the building. And that's obviously where the pot belly stove vent would have vented from inside to outside. You can imagine on cold winter days, the stove would have been fired up early in the morning. And if you sat so close to the stove, you, you might have been very, very warm. But if you sat too far away, the building might be very cold for you. Also, the building lacked the amenities that we think of today. There's no inside bathrooms. Uh, there's no lunchroom, no cafeteria. But only imagine the countless students who would have ultimately exited this building after spending their time here at Long Branch School with an excellent foundation in reading, writing, and arithmetic. One side of the, the building was big, long windows, so we'd open the windows and get air, no air conditioners, no, no, none of that. And uh, when I was telling you, I went down to another school after I was there a year, and one of the neighbor men came to me and said, if you'll come back and teach our school again, said, I will tear that beehive down inside of that school building within the walls, you know, it's between the walls. I thought to myself, I wouldn't have been there this year if I'd known about this, <laughs> but I didn't know about it. Had all the grades together, the little kids did their lessons, and if the older kids would help the little kids, and we would get released at a different time, uh, but most of the kids hung around and played because their older brothers or sisters would would take them home. And like the the Irish Creek Road fort, so we had kids coming from three different areas. And there was about 30 children there, uh, grades one through eight, all in one room. Uh, we had uh, the bigger children or the older children, I guess I ought to say, uh, they would help her with the little little ones. I did that after I got to a certain age, uh, when the little ones would have their lesson. Uh, I would listen to them read, and uh, the things like that, whatever their you know, lessons was about. And then I would tell her if they did good or not, or if one of them had a problem, I'd tell her what it was, and then she would work with them later uh, to get them improved on it. You know, she treated one just like she did the other. Uh, she was like an old mother hen over all of us. School, me and my brother, we walked down the street in front of her house and on down the alley to the uh, black school. And uh, had to go up the side of the hill and up about three steps into the building. And then you had a little area there, you take your jacket off and hang your coats up and you take your rubber boots off if you're wearing galoshes at that time or anything like that and lay them off. Then uh, you went on into the classroom where right in the center of the classroom was a big stove. I was kind of afraid of it because you could see the fire come out of the front of it every little bit. And uh, it's a coal stove. And to the left of the room was a, was a sand area. It was, some, it was like about, I'd say about four by eight. Had a little border around it. And it's full of sand and had like a little bulldozer, little, little toys all in it. We'd play in that sandbox. And then to the right of everything were, were the uh, or the, uh, where you'd sit at, your, your chair and your desk. The, the, uh, the desk that I sit at had a chair in the front of it, but the desk was on the back of the chair. And I'd sit in that chair, and my brother sit beside me. He had another chair. We were the only two in there, so. Back in those days, they, had, they tried to have little one-room schools real close to everybody. And I think we had like 100 at one time. We had no electric, no gas. So a certain boy, we would hire him, I think a quarter a day I gave him, to make a fire in the morning. And we got our wood 
from up on the hill. Whoever owned that hill would allow us to go up there and get wood. Well, you know who got the wood? Two eighth grade boys. We had mad dogs. Of course, we don't have that anymore because dogs all get vaccinated now. And I can't remember if it was in the spring you had to worry about that or in the fall, but all the boys, seventh and eighth grade, they, we, we came from th three different areas into that school, and the older boys carried guns. They carried guns. And they, they would stop, and it was just like, everybody walked, but it was just like a bus. The guys at the end, they, every household, and they'd wait on the kids, and we all come in. And the little boys that were like, you know, third and fourth grade, they took pocket knives and they would put them on the end of a stick and they would put twine around them because we didn't have, we didn't have tape or anything. And they would, it was, it was, it was funny. And we needed oil for the floor. Now, if you don't understand what that was like, it was when the, the floor would get so dusty, we would have to come in and get a five gallon can of oil to put on that floor. And usually it was on Friday so that oil could absorb in that wood over the weekend while the children wasn't there. So uh, at times when we'd come in to the school, we'd have to bring in a lump of coal with us. From outside, we'd grab it and bring it in. And she, she wouldn't let us get near the stove, she'd throw it in, in the stove. And to the back of the building, the whole back of, across the whole back part of the building was a big blackboard. And above the blackboard was your ABCs all along the whole top of it listed. And uh, at times we'd go back there and write with a chalkboard if we wanted to. And then of course we had to go back there and do our ABCs. Open the school, you'd have to go into the town where the middle school is. That big building used to be like a, a book depository. And you went in and the, the one room schools, you got a bucket and a dipper for the water. You got, I think, one eraser and a couple of boxes of chalk, and I remember it was yellow chalk. We had three things to start out with, and that was what we had for all year. And you might run out of the chalk and have to go back and get another box, and he'd give that to you. We didn't have a lot of, we didn't have any machineries. At times was hard, I mean, hardly anybody had money. They had to really watch money. And Mr. Cheek had to watch money about getting teacher's edition. In 1838, Kentucky passed a law that established common schools statewide. The state had $42,500 set for funding, which was distributed across based on student populations per county. Even with the increase in funding, the early schools did not provide many of the services that we expect today, such as transportation and dining. Students often brought their own lunches or visited nearby businesses. They all went home for lunch every day in that one room school. It was gone one hour. You got an hour for lunch. Well, if we didn't take our lunch, we went down to the store. Most of the parents had an account down there, and you were allowed to get a certain amount. You couldn't, you couldn't go over that. And you could get blown, you know, we'd get a bologna sandwich. Oh, my gosh, that was heaven. <laughs> and, uh, you know, a bottle of pop candy bar, potato chips, whatever. And some of us would get tired of that and we would take our lunch. Mom, my mother would fix me a, a sandwich or whatever kind I wanted. And uh, usually some kind of sweets. And, uh, uh, you know, it was really good. And whenever recess came up or we had a, we had a break, we, our break, we walked back to the house. It was only about, a, about 150 yards back up to where we lived. And we'd eat our lunch at the house. Mom had her lunch for us and everything. Then we'd walk back down to the, the school. But we would have different occasions about school because that was that community's, all that was their enjoyment of everything. That's all we had in that community, schoolhouse. And uh, we'd have like soup day. We'd, we'd have a big kettle and we'd make a fire outside. And uh, it didn't cost anybody really anything, except the teacher. She had to furnish the crackers, so the teacher would always buy the box of crackers. And if a um, so little girl would say, my mom canned tomatoes, she'd bring a can of tomatoes for the soup. And somebody else would say, we had potatoes, and they'd bring, what, three or four, whatever they had to bring potatoes. 
and they brought all different vegetables like that till we got enough to make the soup. And when we'd make it, they didn't have to go home for lunch that day because we'd eat soup and crackers. In the wintertime, we made homemade soup on Wednesdays. Oh, mercy, good, on a hot plate. Well, the older children, Miss Barks would appoint them each week. She kept a list, and each week, I, I would take a half a gallon of potatoes cut up, ready to put in the soup. Uh, somebody else would bring a half a gallon of pinto beans. Soup beans, we called them back then. Uh, sometimes, um, and somebody would bring tomato juice, and somebody would bring onions. And onions, tomato juice, pinto beans, and potatoes. That was the ingredients that went in the soup. And you put it in a, the big kettle and fixed it on the hot plate. And back then, we didn't have such things as bowls at school. Back when I was little, the coffee came in just the one pound can, the small can. And we kept those. And that's, people used those at their homes back then. And so we would bring those to school. And we would keep, you know, we would wash them out and keep them washed. And we had a shelf back there that we kept them on. And that was what we eat our soup in. And if somebody didn't have a bowl, whenever you got done eating, you went and washed your bowl and you reached it to the other person. And then they could eat their lunch. And then. all these little one-room schools, they would have a pump. And sometimes you'd have to prime it with water. And you would pump your water into the bucket. And... At, at your homes, you would drink out that dipper, but I can remember my, I remember the lesson, how it was unsanitary, and everybody had to bring in a cup or a glass, and they were all on a little bitty, uh, 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 where all the little glasses were, and when you, you pour your water from the dipper into the glass. We this is a wonderful example of one of Lawrence County's one-room school here on Long Branch in Lawrence County. You can only imagine, even though the size is so much smaller than today's large schools, you can imagine a building filled with children in ages four or five or six through perhaps 12 or 13. Grades uh, kindergarten through sixth or seventh grade, students learning together, one teacher doing his or her best to make sure they had the command of the students' attention throughout the day. But as we know, in many one-room schools, students taught each other, and the teacher was often a facilitator. But anyway, um the one-room school, you could do different things. You were the principal, teacher, law, because nobody else there except you. I would carry home books every night. I'd have to study because I did not know. I didn't know grammar at that time. I guessed, even is and are. I was guessing at it. I didn't know the rule for it. And I made my mind up. My students would know those rules, and I've lived up to it. You did not just get a grade. The grade wasn't given to you there. She believed in you learning. And if you got an A, you earned that A. It wasn't just she gave you an A because. <laughs> and if you did not do your, your work that year, she did not promote you the next year. She would call the mom and dad in, and she would have a conference with them, and she would tell them now, whatever the kid's name was, can do better. I know they're able to do all of this. They're smart. They're just being lazy. And we had a few like that. And so she would tell the parents, they're going to, I'm not going to promote them. And so they'd end up in that next grade again next year. But Moorhead was not, not the people that taught me my grammar. It was these local, older educators that I didn't have too much pride to ask, and they were so willing to help me. That's how I learned what grammar I know. It was an innocent time, it really was. Oh, it was wonderful. I mean, uh, going to school there was just, it was just great. Everybody loved the teacher. Miss Sparks loved all of us kids, and she made no difference in us. I enjoyed uh, the school I was at, had a very good time. It was wonderful. It was wonderful. 
a lot of good memories down in the old school. And like I said, we got things done and enjoyed it. We, we, I did learn. I did learn a few things. <laughs> it was a great experience. I will say that. I'm glad I, I had that opportunity to attend a one-room school. Uh, my mother could have sent me to town to the grade school, uh, but she decided that she was going to send me to the country school, and that's where I ended up first through the eighth grade. In 1933, President Franklin Roosevelt created the New Deal, a series of programs designed to ease the effects of the Great Depression and ultimately put Americans back to work. The Works Progress Administration, or WPA, was one of those programs designed to create jobs to ease the almost 25% unemployment that was ravaging the country. It focused on providing much needed infrastructure in local communities, such as roads, schools, courthouses, and other public buildings. In Lawrence County, several schools were constructed by the WPA at communities including Blaine, Webville, Clifford, Lomansville, Meads Branch, and Fallsburg. This would lead to the consolidation of many of the one-room schools into these larger and more centrally located modern schools. These impressive stone buildings became focal points for their respective communities and would remain in service for many decades. I was born in Fallsburg in about uh, May of 1937 and my father was teaching school in one-room schools in Lawrence County. But I uh, went, started in Fallsburg Consolidated School, which at the time was a four-room school. I think it's all gone now, but it was a sandstone school. You familiar the, with the one up at, up at uh, High Kite, at, at the, what used to be the Meads Branch four-room school? The, our school was just about like that. There was also one at Lomansville that was the same thing, and I think there was one at Clifford. Uh, those, those were built during the 30s by the WPA, the Government Work Progress Administration. And so we had four, we had eight grades and four rooms. So you had two classes uh, in each room. So I went to school at five years old and I loved it. And from then on, I knew that I wanted to be a teacher. The school house that we were in is a block building that was built in either the late 40s or the early 50s. The wood building that was there had burned. I don't remember, have any remembrance of the, of the uh, wood building. But this block building had three huge windows on the east side, so we had lots of natural uh, lighting in the school. And it was just a, one great big old room with a potbelly stove in the middle to keep us warm in the winter time. There was a huge blackboard on the back wall, or on the front wall, behind the teacher's desk, where she wrote. We went up there and did exercises and wrote on the wall, on the blackboard, and did math problems and all kinds of things like that. Above the blackboard was a chart um, poster that had all the ABCs on it with the capital letter and the small case letter. So if you had problems learning your ABC or to write your ABCs, you could look up there and see what to write, how to write. Uh, there was an American flag in the front of the room. There may have been a bookcase, um, I don't know, and a file cabinet for the teacher, and then her desk was up there. Let me tell you, let me tell you a little bit more about Fallsburg School. Uh, we. Um, uh, we didn't have electricity until 47 or 48 after the war and so we had coal stoves and we had uh, we had to uh, we had big pot belly stoves in the corner of ever of all each four each of the four rooms and uh, we had a coal pile and us boys would have to go out and get the get two buckets of coal and bring it in have it there during the winter and we had to have wood to start the fire with and so the teacher's pets could, she'd let us out, or he'd let us out for a couple of hours in evening to go out and pick up wood, little limbs. And we, we were supposed to come back, it'd be about four of us, and we'd be supposed to be coming back with a big load of kindling wood. And that'd last us maybe two weeks. In front of her desk, 
on the student side, there were a row of just chairs, like I'm sitting in today, no desks. And each class, when they had their class time with the teacher, came up and sat in those chairs and had, a, had their class, reading, math, science, whatever it was. And the other people were sitting in, other students were sitting in the back of the room doing homework or assignments, whatever it was. We're standing in the principal's office here on the second floor in the Lomansville Elementary WPA building. One can only imagine that with a desk and chair, the principal had an opportunity to not only keep his eyes and ears tuned in to the students and teachers in the building, but the view outside the window commands a wonderful panoramic view of students when they would be outside. And with the wooden floors in this building, one can only imagine how the creaks and groans of the wooden floors would sound throughout the day with students coming up and down the stairs. Likewise, the sound of the floors would have been enhanced by janitors who would have oiled the floors back in the day to keep the floors smooth and soundless. We didn't have a lunchroom until we got electricity. Couldn't, couldn't have a lunchroom until we had electricity. But the back part of the building had two big long rooms in it with a folding door in the middle and a little stage up here in the first and second grade room. And they could open that up and had a big fam, a big meeting room. We used to have pie suppers, pie socials. And they used to have they, the women of the, the girls of the community would bake a pie and the boys would come in and bid on the pie. And so when two guys were sweet on the same girl, and if you bought a girl's pie, you had the chance, you, to, she'd help you eat it, she'd eat it with you. And so the, the, the young people in the community, if there was two of them sweet on the same girl, and she bought a pie, and they got started bidding against each other, they could, they could bid $10 on a pie. And let me tell you, that was when $10 was, uh, was about a week's work, almost. So, uh, Country schools had books given, uh, I mean, they were issued from the board office, so we had, our, we had books, but we didn't have a lot of other things. So to earn money to buy the other incidental things that we would need or the teacher wanted us to have that we didn't have, we had pie socials. The idea of a pie social was that the girls would bake a pie, everybody in the community adults, everybody. It was, a, it was a big thing. If there was a pie social, people from all around would come to the pie socials. And they would uh, auction the pies off, and the man or the boy or the whoever that bought the pie from the girl that the girl made got to go with that girl and eat some of the pie. And I'm sure there were several couples that became uh, married because <laughs> during these these pie social things. But so the building had in the middle of it was when you go in there was a hallway about 12 feet wide. Then you had the eighth grade over here and a fifth and sixth grade over here. So that hallway was about 24 feet long and about 12 feet wide. And there was a door into the fifth and sixth, and a door into the eighth and seventh and eighth, and a door into the first and second, and a door into the third and fourth. And so the community put a lunch a, cool, a kitchen in that hallway we had a refrigerator we had a sink we had a, a stove and a cabinet and so and we had a counter there and we would we had these metal army trays and so mother and another woman was the cook and they'd cook the meal and we'd come in get our tray filled up and go back to our room and eat on our desk uh, but they also had fishing ponds so there were you'd fish and get a uh, catch a fish and get a number and you get a little toy of some sort. They had a guest cake, which there was something baked, some kind of item baked inside the cake and it, uh, hints were given and you paid every time, you paid money every time you got a hint or made a hint or got a hint, I guess. And then the person that guessed it got the cake. And uh, they also had cake walks and you paid to, uh, probably a dime to walk around a cake in a circle until the music stopped and then when the music stopped if you were standing on the X you got the cake so that was a that was a fun thing but I got a great education in Lawrence County I, I not only did I get a good academic education I got uh, values 
and values are just about as important as knowledge uh, in any kind of an environment. We were definitely isolated because we did not have roads. We had the railroad, but we did not have good auto transportation. Um, so we were, we were isolated. The, the schools were an important part of the community. They gave the community a sense of identity and belonging. And I truly believe that taking away the schools and the post offices from the small communities in eastern Kentucky have diminished some of that pride and feeling of unity with the communities. I feel very fortunate to have been raised in the, in the, in the environment. I'm, I think I turned out to have pretty good values and pretty good work ethic, and I've learned them all right here. Nationwide, schools changed drastically with the 1954 Supreme Court decision in the case of Brown versus the Topeka Board of Education, which outlawed racial segregation in public schools. Fortunately, Lawrence County did not have the same struggles with racial integration as some school districts in the Deep South, where federal intervention was eventually and ultimately required. Prior to desegregation of public schools, Lawrence County included one school for black students in grades one through eight. Older students traveled by train to Booker T. Washington High School in Ashland, Kentucky. For the first two years, I attended school at home. My mother was a school teacher. And uh, also, uh, uh, Mr. Cheek at that time, I guess he was a superintendent of schools at that time, I think. He had something to do with it. He uh, would come by and bring us books every little bit. And uh, my mother would make sure that I would study through the little pamphlets and booklets. And then maybe about once a week or so, uh, Mr. Cheek or somebody from his office would come by. I think it might have been a lady sometimes by the name of Lines, I'm not for sure. And uh, would uh, start to talk to me about how I was doing my studies. And, I thought that's pretty neat. I was, in, I was when I was in the first grade. 54 is when they were talking to us about you're going to probably be going to the other school and things you'll have to, to learn to do. And uh, since it's going to be very new to you, you may not understand a whole lot of things. And, and my teacher was going to be, I already told me what my teacher's name was, Miss Burgess was her name. And my brother's teacher was Miss Jackson. He was in the fourth grade and I was in the fifth grade. But uh, the first day we were there at the school, of course, we just ran in the hall, walked morning in the hallways. Everybody else, a lot of them was all patting us on the back and hollering, how you doing, Fred, and how you doing, Bill? Because we knew, you know, we knew all about all the kids up there because we played with them every day after school anyway. And uh, they showed me where my room was at and they showed Bill where he'd go to his room, Miss Jackson's. So the only problem that we had was, uh, was at lunchtime when time for all the kids to go down and eat lunch. And, and uh, of course, we were we never had to do anything like that before. So, but we all got in line right with the rest of the kids heading towards the lunchroom. And when I got up there, I was there for my brother. This lady said, uh, I, can't, I can't serve you anything to eat. And I said, well, I didn't even know what she was even talking about. And I just said, well, that's OK with me. So I, I got ready to walk to the side. And about that time, I, I don't remember if it was Gary Smith or if it was Ab Van, who's grabbed me by the shoulder and said, wait a minute. I said, you get to eat lunch, we, same as we do. And, uh, and that lady said, said, I can't do that, it's federal law. And uh, then about that time, here come my teacher, and she said, come back here to the room. So I came back here to the room, and they brought me a hot dog back here, she did. And she said, we got to get something straightened out here today, but everything will be okay tomorrow. But at that time, you know, you didn't have segregated uh, lunch areas. You know, that, that was under federal law, or you see. So uh, we went in the next day and did it and all that. I don't know if the, Mr. Cheat got in any trouble, but he, he did things there just about a year before a lot of these other schools claimed they did, did it. <laughs> I know that for a fact. In 1938, the Lawrence County Board of Education hired Bill Cheek as the local superintendent. As the longest serving superintendent in Lawrence County, 
Mr. Cheek held office for nearly 40 years, from 1938 until 1974. His administration led to the consolidation of many of the one-room schools in Lawrence County to the WPA buildings like this in the 1930s, as well as consolidation of several of the local community high schools to create just one high school in Louisa. Because of dwindling attendance at Clifford, Blaine, Webville, and schools like Lomansville, the schools began to send their students to Louisa for high school. I don't think my father thought about being superintendent. He was the principal of the high school. Cradus Williams was a friend, and he was a principal, I don't know if it was Blaine, or in other words, at about the same time, he and dad were contemporaries. And one story that has been told is that both dad and Cradus wanted to be superintendent and they were both friends so they didn't want to hurt each other they didn't want to one to win and the other one be stuck you know so they tossed a coin to decide which one would stay and which one would go and the one to go was Kratos and the one to stay was dad we taught what we were supposed to teach, and Mr. Cheek, he would just come in ever so often to visit each classroom. And he did not announce when he would be coming. So he saw the real picture every time he did. He was a very caring person. He was uh, cared about Lawrence County school children and about Lawrence County itself. Bill Cheek, William A. Cheek. <laughs> he was the superintendent all of the time that I went to school. I can remember being in the first grade at Fallsburg, and Bill Cheek would come down with that black suit and that red tie. Bill Cheek always drove a black car. He said there's only one color for a car, and that's black, and there's only one color for a tie, and that's red. I really liked the superintendent, Bill Cheek. He was my, I liked him the best. So my father was really, really good at getting any loose money if there were um, if there were grants for money, he finally got a person, uh, well, two different people that I remember, that did nothing but write grants. Dad consolidated most all of the one-room schools in Lawrence County and consolidated the high schools, um, Lomansville and Clifford and some of the others were consolidated early on so that all that was left was Blaine and Louisa High School um, when I was a girl. But uh, it cost less to get a, a um, first-rate education if you can consolidate your good teachers, uh, even though you have to transport uh, children sometimes. So Mr. William A. Cheek had he was a unique person, a good person. He had a way about him, whereas now we evaluate teachers and principals and so on. His way of evaluation was very simple. He came in my room one day, and I had all four grades there. And he went to a second grade child, a little girl, and he said, she had a library book on top of her desk. And he said, Sister, what does this say? And he took his finger and ran across that book. She looked at that book and she said, From this to that. That was the title of the book. He didn't say a word. Just a smile came across his face. He looked at me and smiled. He went out the door. I passed the test the child could read those words. So he had a very strange way of testing to see if you were doing your job or not. And it was a good way. Okay, another thing my husband told me was that he went to Clifford and uh, he said the, teacher, <laughs> the teachers would scare the little children by saying, if you don't shape up, if you don't, <laughs> if you don't do as we tell you, we'll get Mr. Cheek or Mr. Elkins onto you. 
Uh, Mr. Cheek was six foot four. Mr. Elkins was six foot two. They uh, both walked kind of slow, and Mr. Elkins actually was, he was, <laughs> he was so smooth <laughs> when he walked. Uh, but Gary said when he was a little boy and Mr. Cheek and Mr. Elkins would come out, he said they were the biggest men I had <laughs> ever seen. <laughs> and he said it was so easy to be afraid. <laughs> so he said they were used. I think it's funny, but I also think it's a little bit sad because I'm sure my father didn't mean to scare children, you know, <laughs> nor would Mr. Elkins. So. But he would come up to the schools and talk to us. In high school, you know, he was all around. Uh, one story I remember, we had, you all remember the old Louisa High School, or I'm sure you, you or you, it was down there. I think it's torn down now. The old building's torn down, but you know where the campus is. And he was real proud of the front lawn out there. And we had gotten in the habit of going out there and playing ball during, the, during recess and during lunch. And we were tearing up the grass on the lawn. And so he assembled us there in the auditorium. And he said, now I want you all to follow me. Don't deviate. Follow me step by step. And so we came downstairs and we went out on the sidewalk from the old building to the new building, which is still, I think, standing, the little gymnasium there. Well, somewhere he, along the line, he had been talking about staying uh, off the grass, but somebody took a shortcut and started going through the grass. And so everybody behind him followed through the grass, and it made a visible path. So he marched us back up into the auditorium, and he said, I want to tell you one more thing. Don't follow me. Stay on the sidewalks. Don't get on the grass. So he was, a, he was very much of a hands-on superintendent. Yes. I don't know, he, he seemed to have a, a better, uh, he could mingle with the ch kids much better. He could come down on your level, and I really like that about him. Mr. Cheek would be coming down the hall, and most likely I didn't see nobody else in the hall but him. And he would always ask me, did I have an excuse? And I would sh show him, and he would want to know whose daughter I was, and I would start telling him, and he would want to know if I was a Job from Twin Branch, and I would say, no, I live at Bussyville. And I would tell him who my grandpa was, and he knew that family really well, so he would name them all off to me, and I would say, yes, <laughs> you know, that's right. But I, I really liked him. I loved when he came to pep rallies because he was, he would get up and he would tell a joke and he wouldn't get no laughs at all. And he would tell, he'd say, well, if I can't do any better than this, I might as well leave, but I'm gonna try one more. So he would try another one. It'd be just a little bit more funnier. And then he'd say, well, I've got one more. And if it don't work, I'm going. And he would tell it and Everybody would roar in there. And that was how he would do when he'd come to our pep rally. And I loved him. I thought he was a, a hero. I, I really did. The best question you could ask me, still yet, this happens sometimes. People will say, are you Bill Cheek's daughter? And being able to say, I am. And you have no idea, my whole day will go better after that. So I think that's pro probably pretty, pretty wonderful to have a father that makes you feel that way, you know, that you can think on him and think, this was a good guy. This was my dad. And, uh, and I'm so grateful. In 1946, the last class of seniors graduated from Clifford High School. The school continued housing grades one through eight until the 1970s. The class of 1949 was the last to graduate from Webville High School. By 1968, all high school students from Blaine were being sent to Louisa High School. Um, I began at Blaine High School in 1960 
and graduated from Blaine High School in 1964. Graduated from Louisa High School in 55. Now at that time, there was still a high school out at Blaine. There had been a high school at Clifford, it was gone. There had been a high school at Webville, it was gone. So I guess that there would have been four high schools in the county at the time, uh, the, the four that I know of. Before I came to Blaine, I did not attend the old Blaine High School, but uh, it had burned in the 50s, maybe 55 or sometime then, and the students uh, had to go to the lodge, uh, Jake Rouse Lodge there in Blaine, and also the churches to continue their education and until um, they got the school built. When I was in high school, down the river where the new where the power plant is, there was no road down through there. The kids down there caught the train to Louisa. The school board bought them a pass on the train. They'd catch the first train up in the morning, and then they'd catch the last train that came through about five or six o'clock, and going down. Barbara Hurt and Thurston Hurt, uh, a lot of, uh, there was probably a, there was probably a dozen People lived down there, children in school, in high school, that uh, rode the train. Well, I, I don't know about, not at our school, but um, the, there was a train that came all the way up through from Ashland to Webville, and there's even an old hotel that's still standing there. There were a lot of high, smaller high schools around back in the 60s and quite frankly I loved it I, I think the small schools there's something to be said for smaller schools but um, we went to um, we went to Greenham County um, we traveled to um, Oxshire had a high school in Johnson County and we just went to to all the different high schools around and we did real well our biggest rival when we were in school was Louisa. <laughs> so Louisa and Blaine did not, they were just big rivals and that's kind of the way it is. It's like Ashland and Boyd County right now. But uh, we, uh, we had good teams, good ball players. We had a lot of ball players that went on to play ball. Who won the games? Yeah. Usually when we, when we played Louisa or Blaine, Blaine did. We had some awesome players. We had a lot of players that went on to play at colleges, and uh, they were really good, uh, good old country boys. <laughs> I was in high school uh, when Mr. Cheek was superintendent, and um, uh, we, I didn't know, when I graduated in 1964, that's a long time ago, <laughs> uh, that they were trying to get rid of the high school. Uh, that they were going to consolidate. And that was a big move back in the day. Uh, when I was in school there, I think one of the years I was there, Blaine was consolidated. The high school was consolidated to Louisa. But until that time, Blaine was the mortal enemy when it came to sports. Those Blaine kids were pretty good at sports. And so it was like this big battle. So I'm sure it was rough for them when they had to come to Louisa High School. Louisa High School and and join us but eventually you know time solves problems like that. Oh the lunches. The lunches were to kill for. They were awesome. We we had home-cooked meals and uh, we had uh, one of my favorites was uh, uh, our cook at that time was Flora McKinnon. She was awesome. She would make meatloaf, mashed potatoes, and peas. But we had totally a full course meal for lunch, and it was great, fried chicken, um, er, any uh, real good stuff, nothing out of cans. <laughs> In Louisa High School, we did not have a lunchroom, and we went, down, we went downtown to Rips and Nell's Restaurant. There was two, there was about three little restaurants in downtown Pikeville. And uh, I got 25 cents to buy lunch with. And a hot dog cost 
10 cents and a hamburger costs 15 cents and a Coke or soft drink costs a nickel and potato chips cost a nickel. So for 25 cents, I could get a hamburger and a Coke and a box and potato chips. But if I got a Coke and a hot dog, I had 10 cents left over. And I could go across the street to Buttermilk's pool room and play a game of pool for 10 cents. So, uh, we did not have a lunchroom. When the bell rang at 12, you ran downtown and you ran. <laughs> I mean, you ran. If there was a green light, you just went right in front of it because you had to get there so that you could eat and get back. And there were several little restaurants in town. Rips was a restaurant that uh, served really good food. And uh, in the back, they had a little room with the jukebox and we'd go back there and dance because the 50s, you danced. And if you don't dance now, you're missing a lot. Um, there were just several little places you could go and eat. Dee's was there, I guess, yes. And Dee's was the hangout then and still is, I hope. Um, I remember after school, after cheerleading practice, I'd go down and I was skinny as a rail and I'd get a milkshake trying to gain weight. And a band was the thing. Band was really big. We probably had a hundred marching band members. Fantastic. Um, Richard Wilson was our first band director and later Pete Armstrong. And Richard Wilson had a wonderful band. We, we were just such a close-knit group and we were on the top floor, practically the bell tower of the old building. This really old room. The stairway was real narrow and I played the tenor saxophone that had to be in a case to take it home. And getting down those stairs when that last bell rang, because I rode a bus and the bus would leave quickly, was like, you know, take your saxophone and move a few people. <laughs> it was wild. But then I began, as soon as I graduated, I began my career at Blaine Elementary School. The high school was gone, of course. It, it, they closed the high school at Blaine in 1968. And, um, my teaching career at Blaine was um, a passion of mine. I loved every day of going to school and teaching. I taught sixth grade for 12 years, self-contained, every subject. I, uh, I was certified in one through eight, and I taught every subject, and I loved it. I taught two years from 63 to 65, and um, I taught English and I taught science. I had a major in neither. I didn't quite have a qualified minor in science, but I'd had a lot of science classes, so they gave me science. Every night I studied more than the kids did. I wish I thought they studied as much as I do. I remember my dad taking me out and showing me the powertrain of a car and pistons and how they fire and, and all that, or I <clears throat> wouldn't have known what I was talking about. And let me tell you about teaching the first two years, I think, that I haven't said, it was amazing that that year, instead of having the students move, the teachers moved. So the kids sat the same place all day. And one of my classes was downstairs and one of them was upstairs. And before I could take three of those steps at a time and get up those steps, there'd be a fight in the upstairs room because the kids sat there all day. It was just awful and I felt so for them. A lot of times we'd take a walk around the school building because I figured their legs were going to go numb but it was um, not a good situation. Then we um, departmentalized and I taught sixth, seventh and eighth grade social studies. I chose social studies. I could have taught science but I love history so I taught social studies and loved it and um, I retired in 2007 and after I retired, that I realized I shouldn't have retired quite that early. But I had two grandchildren I was raising because their mother had passed away and I thought it'd give me more time. But I currently serve on the Board of Education here in Lawrence County. And um, I, uh, I love serving kids and that's what it's all about. It's not about the adults. It's about you young people. You're the future.
The last year when we were at the old high school, the seniors were complaining and complaining and complaining about everything was for the next class. The juniors were going to get to go to the new school. They weren't getting anything. They were just very upset. So I said, okay, let's do something. Let's do a homecoming. I've been at college and experienced homecoming at college. And so I said, let's do homecoming and let's do it really special. So we started out with selecting a queen. And I remember the first girls in the court rode around the football field on the back of a truck. Lovely. <laughs> but they did. And the little girl that was the first homecoming queen was um, Sandy Atkins. And she had just, she was a senior and just found out she had leukemia. And she did die of it. And they elected her queen, which I'm sure was very special to her and her parents. And it was just um, the compassion of the kids that did that. It was, a, it was a good place to grow up. The community was very safe, very, very safe community. And alcohol was not a problem. And drug, we didn't know what drugs were. So it was a great community to, to, to live in. Louisa High School continued to be the flagship school of the system as all county students eventually became Bulldogs. Headed by Superintendent Cheek, plans to build a more modern high school to better serve the students of the county started in the early 1970s. Mr. Cheek's radical idea for the architecture of Lawrence County High School was realized when he built on a campus just south of the city of Louisa. At a cost of $2 million on land purchased from Phil Priest, the structure consisted of three round buildings connected by the cafeteria. The defining characteristic of the school was the lack of walls between classrooms. Mimicking the structure of one room schoolhouse, it was thought that students could hear content of other classes and expand their learning. I've been in education in Lawrence County in one form or the other since childhood. As a little girl, I did not have to go to kindergarten because we only had kindergarten at Louisa Elementary at the time. And my mother refused to put me on a school bus because I was very short and little and she didn't want me on a bus. So I started first grade at Fallsburg Elementary. And at that time we were in the old WPA building. And the building was first and second grade in the same classroom. Went to Fallsburg from grades one through eight in second grade, the middle of second grade, they built the new school, the new Fallsburg Elementary. And we moved in. And to go from a building that had wooden floors, where you could still smell the oil, because they used to oil the floors, you could smell that. And then we go into this building that's made of cinder block and has tile floors and they're polished and gleaming. Peggy Butcher was my third grade teacher and she was phenomenal. It was her first year ever teaching school. She absolutely, loved her job. I had known since I was in first grade what I would do with my life. I'd be a teacher. I knew that. In third grade, we had a day she asked us, what are you going to be when you grow up? And I said, I think a nurse. And she said, you know that involves blood. And I said, nope, I'm back to a teacher. And she told my parents, she said, I just remember her face like, mm, nope, not happening. And she was right. That was my, my it's my destiny. I went to Louisa Elementary School in Lawrence County here in 19... 76 started. I went to Louisa Middle School, which is now Louisa East, and that's down by the, by the bridge. I was there through my middle school years, and then I ended up going to Lawrence County High School and graduated in 1988 from here. I had Matilda Hewlett for seventh and eighth grade. And when you say somebody's the epitome of a teacher, Matilda Hewlett is the epitome of a teacher. She was who I wanted to be. Well, I had uh, Carolyn Preston, was one of my social studies teachers. I remember her, and that's kind of where I, I got my idea of becoming a social studies teacher. Um, I remember Mr. Michael, Eddie Wayne Michael, was my principal at that time. He was actually the first person that gave me my job. So that was a, a connection I made there. Um, I had Mrs. Williams was here, Charlene Williams. She was the math teacher at that time, and I remember her and her math classes. So enjoyed math a lot and did a lot of work in math later on in my career. <laughs> so I leave college, I graduated on a Saturday, and on Monday I walked in the superintendent's office of Lawrence County Board of Ed. And I asked to see Mr. Michael, Eddie Wayne Michael. And I said, I've graduated and I want a job, Mr. Michael. And he said, 
we'll see what comes up. I said, oh, okay. Come back in about three weeks. Okay. I put in my applications. I had done everything I should do. I did not even apply in another district because I didn't even want to leave this district. I did not apply to teach anywhere else. Didn't hear anything. End of July, I'm thinking, well, I'm going to be a substitute all year long. Let's just the way it's going to be. I'm going to deal with it. It'll be all right. And Sam Line called. He was now the principal of Lawrence County High School. He said, we have an opening, ninth grade English. Would you like an interview? I said, yes, sir. He said, now let me tell you, half the day is in school detention. And I thought, wow, I'm 21 years old. I'm going to be an in-school detention teacher with kids who are 18. I thought, okay. But I thought, I want a job. Yes, sir, I'll do anything. I'll come interview for that. I interviewed, found out I had the job, started school on Monday. Literally interviewed on a Friday, job starts on Monday. Um, it was probably the end of July. I came in to, I got a phone call from uh, Mr. Michael, and he had, us come in, had me come in and, and offered me a job at Fallsburg Elementary School. Basically, I came in and, and he said, Mr. Allen, P.T. Allen was our principal at that time, said, Mr. Allen, this is going to be your new social studies and English teacher. He's going to coach basketball and he's going to do football for you. I learned from some great teachers there. I had Mrs. Hewlett, Matilda Hewlett was one of the, the teachers there. Uh, Mrs. Bur uh, Butcher was there at that time. Um, Mr. Lesher was teaching science. So they all took me under their wing and they taught me a lot about education that you don't get when you go to college. A lot of construction had gone on. I know Louisa East had renovations had started. That used to be the high school. So they had turned it into an elementary at some time and then they'd done a really nice renovation on it. The middle school had been built. That's still the newest school in the district, Louisa Middle School. It was only a couple years old when I got here in 96. This place would not see any significant renovations until about 2002. Um, they took the academic, well they joined all the buildings together. They built the, um, the science wing, because that, that was not there, that was a side parking lot. You used to have to go outside to, you would have to go outside to get to the music building. So they connected all that and built our new science classrooms and labs. Um, my room was in the library. The center of academic building uh, was the library. So they turned all those into classrooms. They actually expanded the academic building. They, they pulled the walls out about 10 feet. Um, and that's, that's it. I mean, this building dates back from 77. I know originally it didn't have walls and they put up temporary walls and uh, I guess young men would hurl staplers and pencils over them because you know they didn't go all the way to the ceiling. And then uh, sometime in the 80s we actually got cinder block walls. Uh, when I was hired in 93 I got to see the first, well it's actually the second um, add-on. 1973 they built the first add-on which was the kitchen and the gym, gymnasium. And then in 93, they built the uh, new middle school wing on with the science room and so forth. So when I got hired that year, they were building that wing on. That was brand new at that time. So I got to see those two, I got to see that one addition to Fallsburg. From the time I started teaching until now, education has greatly changed. We went from having a set of standards that they said, here's your curriculum, teach it. They handed you a book, literally. I didn't have a teacher's edition. I didn't even have a classroom for two years. I floated around the building with a cart and a book bag. And really, there wasn't a lot of pressure. The high stakes testing had not become the thing at that time. There are more ways to become a teacher. That has changed a lot over the last 16, 17 years. If you don't have a teaching degree, like you just go into a field like engineering, or you just go into accounting or whatever, and nursing, you, know, you don't have a teaching degree though, just a straight bachelor's in that uh, field. You can go back to school and go through, I guess it's a two year program, year and a half, called the MAT, Masters of Arts in Teaching. Yeah, it, you're picking up a master's, but you're also picking up a teaching certificate. I think one of the biggest changes now, when we saw changes into Common Core and Kentucky adopted those standards, it became very focused on depth of teaching a standard. So it's no longer just reading a kindergarten kid learning to read. 
it's now they have to learn to read, but they also have to identify the main idea of a passage. They have to be able to talk about the author's point of view. They're in kindergarten. They're trying to learn the sounds. They're trying to work with phonics and phonemes. They're just trying to learn to read. And the standard is set very high for that little baby. I can't believe how much has changed just in the 26 years I've been teaching. I mean, going from from the, the student to, to building you know, more, more work for the student, more combined activities, more independent learning, where I think a lot was more teacher-centered when I first started out. So I believe that you know, five years, ten years from now, I think the students will be basically doing a lot of their own educating and the teachers will be facilitators. As far as the future, um, the future of Lawrence County Schools really depends on the future of education in this whole state because mm -hmm. we need more funding. Uh, we've actually, over the last 25 years, the state has Actually, over the last 15 years, the state has really cut, 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 cut education funding. So now we're, I guess we used to be in the middle of the country as far as funding ed, and now we're like 46. How has technology changed in my 25 years thus far of teaching? I started teaching, we had the red grade book, you had a teacher's edition after I called and asked for one from the company, begged for a free one because I didn't have one. <laughs> And that was pretty much it. And you did your grades by a calculator and you submitted them to the guidance office. And then when they, the internet, the World Wide Web became very popular, we started having computer labs. And really in the beginning, we were pushing our kids to build a PowerPoint to present information to us, do a little research online, learning how to search on the web, ask Jeeves, dear Lord, we were all sick of ask Jeeves because the kids thought it was the only website to go to as a search engine. Um, we had to teach them what's really credible. As teachers, we were asked to start implementing technology into our teaching then. First, we used it as a tool to let the kids present. Got the kids up, made a PowerPoint, they'd put in so many sound effects, they'd have so many slides. Then we got to where, okay, what are you as a teacher gonna do to embed it? Now, we're sitting in the high school that's one-to-one -one Chromebooks. I'm old school, so I think it has its pros and I think it has its cons. I think technology, it's beautiful when it's used the right way. Um, I think you have to set up Google Classroom to your benefit, but there are still things that children need interactions with adults. They still need to have conversations. They still need to be taught and looked at and stop and say, this is where your mistake's at. There still has to be that interaction. The adult and student interaction that compassion, that caring, knowing there is somebody there who is gonna help guide you, who really does have your best interest at heart, I'm afraid that's gonna disappear if we don't keep it on the forefront. Do I think technology's bad? No, I don't. Smart boards are great. I think the projectors are great. I think there are things that our teachers are doing in classrooms with technology that is phenomenal. But I worry that it can become a sit and get looking at a screen. Hopefully in the future there's just more networking between college and, um, and classrooms through technology. So other than that, I don't think it's going to change much. Maybe different schedules. Instead of a seven period day like almost everybody's on, maybe we'll have some, I don't know, go back to block or do like modified block or go back to semesters. We actually used to be just semesters, which was block. So I don't know. The next 10 to 20 years what will public education in Kentucky even look like? Will these profit charter schools come into being and take away students and change the look of education? Will the senior year even disappear? It's a question I have with the changes we see right now. We have many students enrolling in dual credit classes through college, and it's a great thing that they can walk out of here with 21, 27 hours. But are we taking away cognitively and physically what they need at that time? Are they really mature enough to handle it yet? That's my question. I think some kids are. I'm not sure about all kids. I have a passion for teaching. I think it is one of the greatest things in the world. I think that being able to work with kids, watch them learn, watch them grow, see them become confident in who they are is one of the greatest things you can do. 
So when I look back at it, I say, okay, I was a kid here. This is my home. I don't want to leave it. Don't plan to leave it until I retire because I know the kids of Lawrence County are worth every minute we put into them, and they are. Lawrence County schools have come a long way since the days of the old one-room schoolhouses constructed in the late 1800s. Lawrence County has seen both the expansion of those one-room schoolhouses and then the school buildings that were built during the WPA process, and ultimately, and eventually transformed into modern learning centers like we see here at Lawrence County High School. Today, our students are connected with other students not only across the Commonwealth, but even around the world, thanks to the internet. Lawrence County Schools not only educate the citizens for the future, but build an education community that is based on tradition and pride. Students now have countless opportunities to grow and flourish in areas even beyond academics. Students are sure to go through drastic changes in life in the next 100 years, and the preparation is not possible without the classroom teachers who instill passion, trust, and belief in each student to be his or her very best in every aspect of life. But the one thing that is constant, schools will always be preparing students to be successful.